Greetings again today in the name of Jesus Christ, our wonderful Lord and Savior. Now it's good to see you here in the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church today. We welcome every one of you. May the Lord bless you. And you that's listening out in the radio listening audience, we most certainly appreciate you tuning in to the Northside Baptist Church Hour that's coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Church here in Athens, Georgia. Now you out in the radio listening audience, if you'll call a friend and have them to tune in and get the broadcast, then we can be a blessing to them. Maybe you know of a shut-in or someone that's disabled to be in God's house today, and you'll have them to tune in to WNGC and get this hour coming up. You'll be doing them a great favor, and we appreciate that so very much. Now we welcome every visitor here in the auditorium. We welcome you in the radio listening audience. And now today, if you have your Bible, I want you to turn to the book of Acts chapter 11. I'm going to speak to you today on this subject, what, where, why, and when God's people receive their greatest name. Let me give you that again. What, where, why, and when God's people receive their greatest name. Now this is tape number 149. We have the singing this morning and the message on cassette tape, and they're available. We'll send you a tape out at your request if you write in and close a gift of $3 or more to help pay for radio expense. You can call for the tape by number or by title. And this number is 149. And if you'd like to have this Sunday's cassette tape, get in touch with us. We have other tapes. Tape number seven is deathbed repentance. Can a person be saved on his deathbed? Can a man live all of his life for the devil in the last few seconds, get right with God and go to heaven? Can he do that? That's tape number seven. Tape number 20, why God called the rich farmer a fool. Tape number 19, climbing into hell. Tape number 35, the Antichrist. Who is the Antichrist? When is he coming? Tape number 52, what will take place after the rapture? The next great event is the rapture. What's going to take place after that? Tape number 56, the coming of the Lord and the man of sin. The Lord is coming and also the man of sin. We'll tell you about that in this message. When you're writing in for the tape, if you do so and you'd like to have one of our brochures on our proposed Holy Land tour, just say, Preach Edward, send me. Your brochure on the Holy Land tour tells you all about it. When we'll be leaving, how long we'll be gone, what it'll cost, where we'll be going. We'd like for you to have this brochure. Some of you reach retirement age and never taken a trip of this type. As a real trip of a lifetime. You can spend your means in a greater way than going to the land where Jesus walked and walk up on the ground where he walked, ride on a boat on the Sea of Galilee where he walked on the water, Eat Simon Peter's fish. Visit the Mount Calvary where Jesus is crucified. Go into the garden tomb where his body lay for 72 hours. Visit the Salt Sea. And then visit Egypt, the Sphinx, the Pyramids, the Museum, the River Nile, and many other historical places. Real, real trip of a lifetime and the price is reasonable. We'd like to talk with you about it. I wish we had some here in the church would decide to go with us next year. We never know when will be our last tour. This will be tour number 12 for me, the Lord willing. And it would thrill my heart. We have had some of our members to go, but it would thrill my heart if others would really sacrifice and make this trip. You may say, Preach Edwards, I can't afford it. Well, if you'd save your Christmas money and your vacation money and your special day money and money you practice throw away, You'd be surprised how quick you'd get up enough money to make this tour, and it'd be a tour of a lifetime, something that cannot be taken away from you, something to mean something to you until your dying day. Now, if you have your Bible, turn to Acts chapter 11, verse 19. Now, they which were scattered and brought upon the persecution that rose about Stephen's traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. And some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. 
And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. Then tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church which was in Jerusalem. And they sent forth Barnabas that he should go as far as Antioch. Who when he, when he came and had seen the grace of God was glad. And exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. For he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith. And much people was added unto the Lord. Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. It came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. In these days came prophets from Jerusalem unto Antioch. And there stood up one of, the, one of them named Agabus. And signifying by the Spirit that there should be a, dirt, a great dearth, that is a drought, throughout all the world, which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined us in relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea, which also they did, and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. Now that's reading from Acts chapter 11, verse 19 through 20. I made mention of the tape, I made mention of the brochure. But I failed to give you my mailing address. This is for you and the radio listening audience, of course. My mailing address is Virgil Edwards, P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia, 30603 is the zip code number. You pray for us as we sojourn for God. Now we're going to find out today something about the when, when, why, and what of the greatest name given to God's people. If you notice here, I read in my text, the Bible said they, that is God's people, were called Christians first in Antioch. That is the greatest name ever bestowed upon the people of God, to be called Christians. Now the word Christian means to be Christ-like. Now to be a real, true Christian in every sense, you must be Christ-like. Now we have many millions today that carry that name Christian, but they are not real, genuine Christians. They just go by the name. And all over the world today you have people using that name, but I'm talking about the name Christian in a real sense. That name was bestowed upon God's people in Antioch, and they deserved it. And from that time until now, that name has been bestowed upon People that love God and know God and serve the Lord Jesus Christ. I know we have all kind of so-called Christians and church members today. You have the wheelbarrow church member. He's no good unless you push him around. As long as you push him and push him, you might get something out of him in the way of serving God or attending church. Then, of course, you have the canoe church member. If the preacher will give him a paddling about every other Sunday from the Word of God, you might be able to get him to move around a little bit for the Lord. Then, of course, you have the kite church member. He's the one, if you don't tie him to something or give him some kind of obligation or position in the church where he's liable to fly up to the mountains on Sunday or go down to the lake or someplace and go visit Aunt Susie or go to Grandma's reunion. But if he has a responsibility in the church... Many times he'll try to put God first occasionally and those things second. Then you have the football church member and he's the one you just know which way he's liable to bounce. He's liable to bounce east, north, south, or west, straight up or straight down. You just don't know which way he's going. You have to kind of guess about him. Then you have the balloon church member. He's the one that's full of wind, ready to blow up and every little thing comes along. And you have church members like that just ready to blow up about most anything. Whichever way the crowd's going, there go along. And then, of course, you have the rowboat. You have to paddle them along. And then you have the motorboat that has the motor on it that will carry the boat where you want it to go. And then, of course, you have that grasshopper church member. Now, that grasshopper church member is one that's never, never satisfied. They'll jump around from one church to another, never satisfied. I'm not condemning on people for changing churches occasionally but if they are the right kind of Christian they'll eventually get their feet on the ground but the grasshopper church member never does never gets his feet on the ground he'll just jump from one church to another when he gets around all of them he start over again then you have the red light church member like Lot 
Lot was a red light church. Remember, he just moved right on down into town and stopped and sat there. And there he vexed his righteous soul with the filthy conversation of the Sodomites. Then you have the uh, blinking light church member. That's a kind like old Simon Peter on and off, praising God one day and cussing the next. You have that kind of church member, good God on Sunday and good devil on Monday. Now when Simon got a good dose of the Holy Ghost, he cut out that foolishness. And then, of course, you have the beacon light church member, and that was Paul. He went forward regardless of the weather or what faced him. He just moved right on and right on and right on for God, one of the greatest preachers that ever lived. Then, of course, you have the hobo church member. He's the fellow, if the rest of the people will put their tithes and offerings in the church and pay the bill, uh, he'll come and enjoy it, enjoy the heat, the air, the lights. And like to have a place for his funeral and like to have preacher visit him when he's sick. But don't say anything to him about his money. He's not going to tithe. He's a God robber. And he's going to hold bow his way through. As long as somebody else pays the bill, then he's all right. But if you say too much about it, he'll get mad and, and won't come back to church. He's a hobo church member. And then you have the fair weather church member. If the weather's beautiful like it is today, why? Well, He'll say, well, I think it'd be a pretty good day to go to church today, but it's a little windy, a little cold, a little rainy. He'll cover his head up and stay in the bed. And he's the kind of fellow in the wintertime he can't afford, he can't stand to see his wife get up and build a fire so he covers his head up until the room gets warm. Now you have a lot of church members like that. And then you have the lily church member. They neither toil nor do they spin. But you have some that's like a good watch, open face, pure as gold, quietly busy, full of good works. And that's the kind we need to carry on God's business. Now, if an automobile had as many useless parts as some churches had useless church members, the thing wouldn't roll downhill. In fact, you'd have to get a dozen men to push it downhill. But, beloved, we try to carry on and do the best we can with what we have and try to encourage others to really get out of business with God. Now, that church down there at Enyart was active. Now, it wasn't active like the dear old colored preacher said his church was said it was a hundred percent active and he bragged about his church being a hundred percent active and someone said to him one time he said you're always talking about your church being 100 percent active said i'd like you to tell me more about it he said simple said i have a hundred members 50 active for me and 50 active against me now they had active church all right now that would have been pretty good if it all been active for god but you have active churches and act acting in different directions some for the church, some against it, some for the preacher, some against him, but they're active like a swarm of bees. And then the church down at Antioch was very active and they were active in the right direction. That's why they were called Christians. They were very busy. Verse 19, now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen's traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch preaching the word. Now there was a great persecution there in Jerusalem. They stoned to death the first deacon that they ever selected there in the uh, First Baptist Church in uh, Jerusalem. And he was a great man of God and preached one of the greatest sermons. He preached the longest sermon that's ever preached in the Bible other than the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus taught. And his name was Stephens. He was selected to be a deacon and he served well and he loved the Lord. And whenever they brought him in to question him, and that was before Paul was saved, that is Saul of Tarsus. Saul was a rank leader of putting Christians to death and hauling them away to jail and prison. And he was the leader of the group that uh, stoned Stephens to death. In fact, he held their coats. He said, boys, let me have your coats and get you some rocks and let him have it. And there they beat poor Stephens to death with stones. But before they killed him, he preached them a sermon that gave him the lockjaw, the longest sermon in the Bible, it was preached by a deacon, the first deacon ever selected there into the church in Jerusalem. Deacons have a great responsibility. I thank God for my deacons here at Northside. I love them. I thank God for them. Some churches have deacon problems. We never have any deacon problems here. Very seldom do we ever have any disturbance on the deacon, but I don't know when we ever have. And I love these deacons, and they love the Lord. They love their church. They love their pastor. I've heard preachers get up and fuss and almost cuss deacons and then uh, fuss on them all the time. 
And that's unwise. Preachers would have a rough time if they didn't have some good deacons to work with them in getting out the gospel and carrying on the work of God and standing by their church. And we thank God for them. The Bible said they're in a place of honor, and I do know they're in a place of a special reward for their service at the judgment seat of Christ. And their service is just as important as a deacon, as a pastor is in the pulpit. And every deacon ought to realize that his service in his church is just as valuable and just as important before God Almighty as a pastor's position is in the pulpit when it comes to serving the Lord. And it's an honorable position. Every man that loves God, that lives a good, clean life, cannot go wrong in being accepted and honored by being placed on the deacon board of his church. God looks down from heaven and sees that action, and God honors that. And that's invaluable. I thank God for our good deacons here at Northside. We love them and we appreciate them. And they love their pastor. And so Stevens was loved by the church, a great man of God. One of the first deacons and preached the great sermon. They stoned him to death. And before he went to heaven, his face began to brighten up like the face of an angel. And he went on to be with the Lord. They served God there at Antioch where they received this name. Now, getting back to Stevens, the reason I mention Stevens is that Stevens, upon the, the persecution and the martyrdom of Stevens, then they begin to scatter out, the Bible said. They begin to move out all except the apostles. The apostles remained in Jerusalem, but the Christians and the deacons began to move out. And the evangelist, Philip was a deacon and later became an evangelist. And they moved out and began to spread the gospel. And they kept going and going until they came to Antioch. And there they won people to God and organized this great church. I'd like to say here was my privilege to visit this church many years ago. It's in the side of a hill uh, carved out on the side of a mountain. And I went in that church. I've been there. I've seen it there in Antioch. And it was the greatest church, one of the greatest churches in that area. In fact, Antioch in those days was the capital of Assyria. And they had uh, maybe 50,000 people there. Today they don't have that many. They do go to have 10,000. But then they had a great number. And Antioch is not the capital of Assyria anymore. I think Damascus is. But anyway... In those days it was, and they went that far and preached the gospel, one people in God. Revival broke out. The apostles heard about it, and they sent men down from Jerusalem to go down to help them out. And they sent Barnabas. He was one of the men that went to help them out. And the Bible said Barnabas was a good man. Let me say just a word at this time about Barnabas. Now, Barnabas was a great servant of the Lord there in Jerusalem in the early church, and he served God faithfully. And he was a good man. The Bible said he was a good man. Now when God calls a man a good man, you can mark it down, he was a good man. My early, my first pastor, with that, after God saved me, I joined uh, the West End Baptist Church in the city of Greenville, South Carolina. And we had a pastor there, a very humble man of God, uh, the brother W.F. Lister. Today he's an aged man and disabled to preach. But uh, anyway, he loved God. And I've heard a lot of people say about this man when they see him walking down the street, they'll say, now that's one more good man. That is one more good man. And he was. And the same thing was said about Barnabas. It wasn't said about some of the others. But it was said about Barnabas. He was a good man. If you recall in the Bible, in the book of Acts, how they, when they needed some money there in the church in Jerusalem, this man, Barnabas, had some land. I don't know where he got the land. Maybe he worked hard and earned it. Could have inherited it, but he owned some land. And Barnabas wasn't only a tither, but he went and sold his land and took every dime of it and put it in the church. Put that money in the church. You can't go wrong in putting money in a local, Bible-believing, fundamental church. You just can't do it. You can't go wrong in doing so. God will bless you for doing it. And Barnabas put his money in that church there in Jerusalem, every dime of it. Now you may say, now preach that, but you mean he just uh, put all the money he got out of his land? That's exactly right. He didn't hold back anything. He put it all in the church. He didn't know when he was going to die, neither do you. He didn't know when the Lord might come back, neither do you, neither do I. And he wanted to be sure that he wasn't going to leave a pile of money behind 
But he went on, if Jesus came, or if he should go on to be with the Lord. A lot of people make a grave mistake. They say they're Christians, they say they love God. They hold up a lot of money and leave it behind for their children to fuss and fight and go to hell over. I know families today, children won't speak to one another because they fell out about the money or the property that mother and dad left when they died and they fussed and fought. I've been to a funeral where they almost get in a fight over the jury mama had on her hands, whether they bury it or leave it with some of the children. Almost have to hold them apart. Now that's pitiful. Now don't misunderstand me. It's all right and good if you have children to lay up a nest egg for them, to have after you're gone, be, providing you have it set up right so there won't be any fussing and quarreling about it and, and falling out and won't speak to one another and let the youngins grow up in atmosphere and die and go to hell. That would be sad. Now some of you people don't have any children. You'd be wise if you'd fall in love with God and be concerned about where your money goes when you die and be sure it's invested in the work of God and you'll be rewarded for it at the judgment seat of Christ. There's a lot of dear people don't have any children made out their wills to their churches. So when they die, that money will be used to carry on the gospel, support missionaries, do the work of God after they're dead and gone. I'd rather do it that way, leave it behind the I feed a bunch of people that's too sorry to work and, and the tax people take it in Washington and spend it on liquor and things of that type. I'd much rather put it in the work of God and be sure that it's lined up for God's work when I'm gone than for it to fall in the hands of a gang of sorry people on welfare that, that wouldn't uh, work in a pie factory sampling pies. Now if you're wise, you'd think about that and pray about it. And if you don't have any children, get lined up and set your guide and your aim to be sure what you leave behind will go into the service of God some way or another. You're wise if you do so. Now, Barnabas was a good man. Another reason he was called a good man, on one occasion when Paul was converted, and Paul started out preaching Jesus, and he came to Jerusalem as afraid of him. They said, well, we, we're afraid of that man. We know what he's done. While he stood there, a guilty man, holding the coats of people that that stone death our deacon and I, we don't, we, we're afraid of him. We don't, we don't believe that he's right. We don't believe that he's converted. We believe he's trying to trick somebody. Paul standing there with tears in his eyes, God had saved him. He had started out preaching Jesus Christ. And there Barnabas came up and said, now wait a minute, fellas. I know him. I'll vouch for him. This man's been saved. This man's a servant of God. I've heard him preach Jesus Christ. You don't have to be afraid of him. And when Barnabas recommended Saul, that was it. They opened their arms and took him in. Barnabas was a good man. And he got Paul connected there with the church in Jerusalem. And it took a man like Barnabas to get it done because everybody was afraid of Paul. Not only that, he served in that church at Antioch. He was a humble pastor. He was deeply concerned about him. He was a soul winner. And then we find him... In Acts chapter 13, after serving there in the ministry, we find that uh, he, he was chosen along with Paul to take an offering back to Jerusalem. That's in chapter 11. If they carried the offering back to Jerusalem, they trusted Barnabas and Saul. You're not going to trust somebody that's a crook to take your church money someplace. You're going to trust people you have faith in. And they trusted Barnabas and Saul. They carried the money back to the poor people in Jerusalem. They came back to church at Antioch in chapter 13. They began to fast and pray. And the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Paul and Barnabas, that they may go into the mission field among the heathen and carry the gospel. Barnabas then became a mighty missionary. Thank God for good missionaries. I'm glad that we're supporting a, a goodly number here at Northside. Would we support more? The Lord, would we intend to support more? In the future, they're on the field. They're laboring there. We are praying for them. We're helping support them. And that's a great work. Anybody that's called of God to go to the mission field, I'll take my hat off to them anytime. It's a hard field. Go there where they don't know the language and learn that language and help people. Barnabas and Saul set out there as great missionaries. But you know, during the time here in the church at Antioch, the Bible said that the Barnabas was full of the Holy Ghost. He had great faith. And he was a great soul winner. Now he had faith, great faith. He believed 
that the job could be done. He believed they could accomplish something. Now, you can't get anything done for God without any faith. You've got to have some faith. God honors faith. And you must have some faith and step out on that faith, and God will honor that faith. Like a little girl standing up on a shelf, and Daddy's standing there, and, and she said, Now, uh, Daddy said, Jump, honey, and I'll catch you. And she shook her head. She's afraid, and she's afraid that she might uh, jump, and, and he wouldn't catch her. And he said, honey, you'll have to jump. I can prove to you that I'll catch you if you'll jump. And she waved her little arms and she jumped and daddy caught her in his big strong arms and they laughed together. Now she'd have never known daddy had caught her had she not jumped. Now you've got to have some faith if you expect to get something done for God. God honors faith. Barnabas was a great man of faith and he believed in doing things for God and getting things done and that he did. They were Christians down there at Antioch. God's people have been called Christians since that time. Here about a year or so ago, they called a, a new football coach out here in Arkansas. Some, I don't know how long ago, it's been some time ago. And they have their football team out there. Their mascot's a hog. They carry that hog around. He squeals and they carry him around in a cage where they have to go play football like the Georgia players carry their bulldog. They carry the hog and they'll... They'll squeal and, and make noise like hogs squealing. And so they invited this new pastor in out there to uh, accept the church there nearby. I said coach a minute ago, new coach, I meant new pastor. Accept the church there nearby. And uh, of course, greatly connected and associated with the uh, ball team and so forth. And they had a civic meeting and a great group came in and church people and they were enthused about the new pastor. And one person got up and said, Pastor, we just glad to have you as our new pastor here. We just call you, and we appreciate you coming. You're going to help us all. You're going to be a great help to the team and so forth. And we're just going to let you be our hog caller. Well, the pastor got up and said, Well, I thought I was called here to be your shepherd to lead the sheep, but said, You know your people better than I do. Now, it's always much better, of course, to be able to lead sheep and just lead a bunch of hogs. The Bible speaks about the hog walling again in the mire. And God calls his servants to be leaders of the sheep. Now you can't uh, uh, lead a hog. You've got to get a hog converted and make a sheep out of him. And if you ever make a sheep out of him, then he'll follow the under shepherd. But anyway, he went out there to be their under shepherd and to lead the sheep, not to lead the hogs. All right, we find out in Antioch they were called Christians. They had great faith in God. They believed in supporting their work financially. They are witness everywhere they went. They had a revival. People got saved right and left. They believed strong in the grace of God. They had a God-given pastor. They honored him. They believed in him. They followed his leadership. And God blessed them and used them down in that ark. They were called Christians. Now, thank God for that name, Christian. Many times in soul winning, you might ask a man, are you a Christian? Of you might ask him, are you a born-again believer in trying to reach them uh, to find out where they stand or whether or not they're saved? Now, it's an honor to be a Christian. I'll tell you when somebody says, there goes a Christian, that boy's a Christian, that girl's a Christian, that woman, that man's a Christian. That should mean something. You ought to thank God that you're called a Christian. But in order to be a real, true Christian, then, of course, you must be Christ-like. And verses 29 and 30 it said, Then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief on the brethren which dwelt in Judea, which also they did, and sent it to the preachers or elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. They believed in mission work. They believed in taking care of the poor Hebrews in Jerusalem. They were outcasts because of their faith in God. They believed in going to the mission field. They believed in going out witnessing and soul winning. They believed in going from place to place and house to house, witnessing for the Lord and trying to reach people for the Savior. They were called Christians. They had great honor and great respect for Barnabas. He was a good man. And they were highly honored there to have this man of God as a pastor. Paul came down from there from, and spent, from Tarsus and spent about um, a whole year in teaching them the Word of God. Now they had all these young converts. And when you have young converts, they must be taught and led and fed and loved by the other members. When a baby is born into a family, 
That mother loves that baby. She nurses that baby. She bathes that baby. She walks after that baby. It's taken care of with tender care if she's the right kind of mother. And it begins to grow. And eventually grow up to be a child and a young person and then an adult. The same thing is to be applied in the family of God. When we have a young convert, a young Christian just saved, they're not going to be as perfect as maybe you'd like for them to be because they're babes in Christ. But we have to be patient and loving and kind and, and encourage and strengthen to help them as we sojourn as older Christians. And that's not all the responsibility of the pastor, the deacons, and the teachers, but that is the responsibility of every Christian in every church. When you find a babe in Christ, then you encourage that babe. We have some little fellows, babies here in our church, and as soon as their mothers and dads bring them in, some of our people grab them. They want to play with them. They want to look at want to hold them. They're deeply concerned about it. They love them. And they can't hardly wait for their mothers to bring them into the church. Now, wouldn't it be wonderful when we had a new convert, somebody born again, that all of our members would feel that way and they just couldn't do enough for that young Christian to help him get on his feet and get moving for God? But many times, instead of doing that, you have backslidden church members that sit around like a bunch of critics and criticize every fault that he has. We need to watch about things like that because it's not pleasing to the Lord. So I've told you today when, where, what, and why that they call God's people Christians down at Antioch. It's an honor to be called a Christian. And if you're here today and not a Christian, you ought to become one. If you're out in the radio listening audience and you're not a Christian, you should repent today and get saved. If you're not saved, if you're not a born-again believer, you're not a Christian by any means. You may be called by that name, but you're not. No man can be a true Christian unless he's been born again by the Spirit of God and the Word of God, become a part of the body of Christ and the family of God, then you can be called a Christian. But that's the only way. God bless you. You've listened well. I trust God will use the message to help us all. Let's stand to our feet. Our Father, I pray today that you'll take the message and help us, dear Lord, and use it not only here, but use it out in the radio listening audience. And our Father, speak to many hearts and help us be the right kind of Christian that we should be to the glory of God. Father, may this message stir the hearts of some today. And we thank you, dear Father, for what is accomplished in Christ's name. Amen. Now, David's going to play for us. And if there's anybody in this auditorium that you need to respond to this invitation, I want you to come forward for salvation, rededication, join the church or whatnot while she plays the stanza so far. Mm -hmm. 